Okay, so this morning we are going to actually look at Acts 10. So last week we finished Acts 9 and we looked at the miracles that God did through Peter. First, he heals a paralyzed man who's been paralyzed for eight years and he's healed. And it's interesting that then the next miracle that he does is raising the people from the dead, as in Dorcas. Uh, she's uh, a wonderful woman of the faith. She is loving, she is kind, and she's doing all these great things for the people. And then she dies. And the people in that town of Joppa then says, hey, Lydda, which is where Peter is staying with Simon the Tanner, is not too far away. Let's actually um, call him and um, actually, sorry, Lydda, he's in Lydda at the moment, and let's call him. They have great faith. It's, you have to realize up until now, in the New Testament, with the disciples and the apostles, nobody's been raised from the dead yet. So yet, they call for Peter saying, maybe he can do something. So Peter comes, and just like Jesus raised a little girl from the dead, uses similar words, and says, you know, uh, uh, Dorcas, rise up, or, you know, rise up and uh, and she does she's raised from the dead and this is a great miracle but then when i read the commentaries the commentators and a lot of the theologians say yeah those two miracles were great there's healing and we would think wow somebody's raised from the dead but then what follows is what's really the greatest miracle in a sense which is the gentiles now beginning to receive the gentiles beginning to receive. We are the Gentiles and we are about to receive the gospel. And so let's look at Acts 10 and uh, see what God is about to do with Peter or what the, the layout, what the setting of the stage looks like. And this is Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa. And send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So I'm going to just look at these eight verses this morning because I believe there's quite a lot that is actually in just these eight verses that we could actually learn from and apply to our lives uh, where we are at this stage in our walk with Christ. So it says in verse 1, Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. We know he is not a Jew. Okay, He is working for the army. He is a commander of the army. It was called the Italian regiment. So probably comprised of the Romans and a mix of other soldiers. So he is not a Jew, but it says he is a devout man, one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. So this man is a foreigner, but he is a believer of God. The first lesson is don't judge a book by its cover. When we look at this person, he is a Roman soldier, not just any soldier, he's a centurion. There is no way this guy knows God, who God is. You know, they're always out to get us. They don't care about our faith or whatever. But this man is a devout man. How many of us today probably see other people around us and we go by judgments and assumptions? Oh, this person is from this background, this person is from this household, this person is from this country, this person's color is this color. Therefore, he must be, he or she must be this and this and this and this. And yet, if we were to just stick with that first sentence, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort or regiment, 
we might immediately draw conclusions and go, he's not a good guy. He's a hardened, you know, soldier. But the very next sentence gives us a glimpse of who he really is. So it says here that he was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. A devout man. The question for us today is, are we, are you a devout, God-fearing Christian? It's an important question to ask because here is Cornelius. He says he is devout. Now, we know he has yet to encounter Christ because it's about to happen. But he is a devout man of God. Are we devout? We are much in a much better position than Cornelius today. Because not only do we know who God is, we also know who Jesus is. We also have his word. And on top of that, we have his Holy Spirit. We have all these in our possession. But are we devout? What does devout mean? Continually praying. Continually living out the faith. Continually in relationship with God. His life reflects the relationship that is described here. So for us, are we devout, God-fearing Christians? Are we devout, God-fearing Christians? When people look at us, what do they see? When people hear us talk, what do they hear? When, we, when people observe our life, the way we work, the way we live, the way we speak, the way we think, the way we express ourselves, does it reflect the faith that we claim? My parents were earlier talking about how, um, you know, our neighbors, you know, they, uh, there are a lot of Christians in our neighborhood back in India and how on Sundays, you know, they, they are, you know, going to church regularly. Now, that's great. But then I also said, that's great. That's nice. Wonderful. Bless them. But what happens in our heart is what matters to God. He is not impressed with what he's seeing on the outside. This may look impressive to some people. Oh, there's a house church. Wow, it must be a great bunch of people. No, that doesn't stop there. People might stop there. But God says, what's happening in your heart? That's where we are truly devout, God-fearing Christian. Because if we are truly devout in here, then by the grace and mercy of God and by the working of the Holy Spirit, what then comes out will be the thoughts, actions, and attitudes of a God-fearing Christian. The world will then see. They might not like our Jesus. They might not, like, you know, they might have a thing or two to say about the church and the Roman Catholic church and this church and all the, you know, the bad things that this people have done and that people have done. Okay, all that aside, when they turn their attention on you, you as an individual, what do they see? Can they then put the same claims on you or... Do they go, oh, no, you, no, you, you're different. You, you're not like the other Christians I've met. Why? It's not because they are some expert in Christianity. It's because greater is he who is in us. And we actually allow this he who is in us, the Holy Spirit, to work out what God wants us to do, making us devout, God-fearing Christian. Is your faith visible? Why? I can say I'm a Christian, but here it says he was actually giving many alms to the Jew Jewish people. He was not just throwing money, many alms. It actually has a lot of meaning behind it. He was doing good deeds to others. We see the same thing happening with Tabitha <coughs> or Dorcas from the previous chapter where she was continually doing good to the people and those women who she had done wonderful deeds who were standing around her and they were mourning her. They weren't saying, we want more stuff from this woman, so please bring her back to life. We had a great life. No, they were truly mourning that woman. She was, her love was visible in how she lived. In the same way, this centurion, this commander was a devout man of God and he gave many arms to people. His life reflected the faith. So, is your faith visible? 
Our faith isn't about works. We don't do good deeds to get in God's good books. It never works. But we do good deeds because He has many good deeds planned for us that He wants us to do. And that cannot happen if the first isn't true. I am a devout, God-fearing Christian who lets the Holy Spirit work in me. And then the Holy Spirit says, hey, see that opportunity right there? I want you to do this or say this. There was a time I was actually at Coles, right? And I see this homeless man. Okay, I've seen him around many times. He's looking very much like a homeless man, okay? And I have to say this, he was white, right? So a part of me was being told, go to that man. He's looking at bread. He's looking for the cheapest bread. He obviously doesn't have money. The Holy Spirit is talking to me. God is talking to me. I want you to go and buy him a loaf of bread. Ooh, I don't know. See, I, and this is me, and I'm, I'm being absolutely brutally honest. Oh, I'm just a brown man. I'm an Indian man. He's a white man. What's he going to say? What's he going to do? How is he going to feel? Is he going to get angry? He's going to get upset. And all this, the inner monologue is going. The Holy Spirit had just given me a very simple, simple instruction. Buy the man a loaf of bread. It's not earth shattering, but here I was. And by the time I debated and argued, the man was gone. And then I was like, oh no, I was finally getting ready to say yes. So I walk out and start driving away. And I'm like, Lord, no, I I'm, going to, I'm going to turn around. So I actually go out of the parking lot, come back in. I'm start looking, looking. And I didn't find him. So that opportunity has passed, and now I have the opportunity to beat myself up, which is great. Oh, you know. And then the enemy, our enemy, who's prowling around, ready to give us a knock or two, goes, what kind of a Christian are you? Simple thing you couldn't even do. So it, it struck me. But then God is gracious, because weeks later, I see him again, this time during broad daylight, and he's just sitting there as, as I walk to the bus stop, and I'm like, okay, this is it. There is no, there is no turning back. You know, I sat down with him and I said to him, I said, you know, I saw you a couple of weeks ago and I, I just was afraid, and, but I don't care. Can I get you anything? Can I get you something? It didn't matter to him what I did. That is, that is between God and him. What mattered at that moment when I was prompted to do something and what mattered at that moment when I had to make that choice to sit down or keep walking was, am I listening? Am I obedient? Is my faith visible? It's the same thing with all of us. Every single day. When you're driving, how do you drive? Do you drive like a maniac? Are you praising in different ways with different digits of your fingers? Is there words of praise coming out of your mouth as you pass by? Do you stick to the speed limit? I'd say 60 65, I'm sure there's a 5 to 30 kilometer grace limit in some places. It's all a reflection. Believe it or not, it's a reflection. Do we stick to the speed limit? We might trivialize it, but God doesn't. Because He examines our heart and He goes, there's a reason why there's a big round you know, uh, sign with a circle and it says 60. That means say 60 or under. But we don't think like that. We look at the big things but almost excuse the little things. Ah, white lies. If I kind of fudge the truth a little, that person feels good. I don't feel bad. Everybody is happy. No. If God tells you to do something, do it. This man's faith was visible. He was doing good deeds. What, how does our faith reflect in our everyday living, in our families, with people that we know, people in the church? How are we to each other? Being that we are Christians and we have been forgiven doesn't mean we actually have a license to be terrible to each other, but super holy to all the people outside because I'm all of a sudden a witness. I need to attract people to Jesus. But those who know Jesus, well, they've got forgiveness. It's all good. I can be terrible to them. Now, we've got to be, our faith has to be equally visible within the confines of the body as much as it is outside in our families, with our children. I can stand here and do this, but if I am terrible to my wife and my kids, I am not a God-fearing, devout Christian. My faith and my life does not match up. Does yours match up? A question to ask, is your faith visible? Are you a prayerful Christian? It says here that 
prayed to God. Cornelius prayed to God continually. I've had people say, oh, I'm not very good at praying. It's for the prayer warriors. You're a prayer warrior. I, look, I know there are prayer warriors and it's wonderful that they're prayer warriors. I've got one sitting right here. But that is not an excuse to say, oh, Rob will pray because I'm not very good at praying. You know, I just can't string the words together. <sighs> Prayer is conversation. When any one of us get together and we have a conversation based on the word, built on the word of God, built on the relationship we have with God, and we have that conversation, that's the kind of conversation that the Lord wants with us. There's not a thing that we're going to talk to him about that he doesn't already know, but he still wants us to come and talk to him. Prayer isn't just asking, asking, asking. I want this, I want that, I want this. He is not the almighty teller machine. He's not an ATM. Prayer is conversation. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul actually says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. And some might take that and go, Oh, I need to have these flowery words, Thou, thy, them, thee, amen. No. Walking down the street and say, Lord, you know, this is happening and this is going on. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? What decision do I need to make? Uh, what should I say to super I'm thinking this. I'm feeling this. Could you, could you do something here? Could you do something in that person's life? Praying for other people. Are you a prayerful Christian? Do we take that privilege that we have? Do we take that privilege that we have to come to His throne boldly? Boldly, not with arrogance, not with pride, but boldly. As my children come to me as a father who says, can I have this? Can I have that? It's not quite like that, that we should be with the Lord our God. We should be having a reverent fear of our God, but we can approach Him. Do you do that? Not just for yourselves, but for other people. I can tell you, I need prayers constantly. The enemy doesn't want anything more than to see me crumble as much as he doesn't want to see any of you stand firm in Christ and wants to see all of you crumble. It's not like, oh, you know, okay, Monday at 8 o'clock, I'm going to go attack uh, Kelly, then I'm going to leave him alone for two weeks, you know, because it doesn't work like that. Our enemy is constantly looking for us to fall. Our enemy is constantly looking for us to break communion with our God by laying guilt on us, by putting things in our way, whatever it may be. Don't let flowery words and I need to do it X number of days, you know, don't let any of that be the roadblock that you have for praying and communion with God. Anytime, anywhere, any words, it's better than nothing at all. Are you praying? How often do you pray? What do you pray for? Do you only pray for yourself? Do you pray for others? Do you intercede for your brother or your sister, for your family, for your friends, for your loved ones? God loves that. He wants us to come to Him in prayer. Not because He is needy and egotistical. No, this is relationship building. Spending time in the Word is relationship building. Spending time here in fellowship is relationship building. Spending time in prayer is relationship building. <clears throat> So it says, about the ninth hour of the day, this is verse 3, he clearly saw a vision of an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and arms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. Is the Holy Spirit the boss of you? <laughs> I, I, was, <coughs> I was going to use <coughs> flowery words to describe, oh, is he the king of the... No, very simple. Is he the boss of you? Or are you the boss of yourself? Is he the one who you take out of the cage for special occasions, but when everything else is going great, it's all you? No Holy Spirit, no word of God, no nothing. I know. I've got experience, I've got life experience, I've done this, I've done that. Back in 1982, I did this, so therefore the same applies today. Or, is the Holy Spirit the boss of you? Is He the one that you actually give and yield control over to? Is He the one who says, hey, I know what I want you to do today? Yes, you can make plans and there's nothing wrong with that. Many other plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord who directs his steps. Are you letting the Spirit of God 
direct your steps. Is he the boss of you? Is the Holy Spirit the boss of you? A question to ask. So God calls him in a vision, Cornelius, and he says, what is it, Lord? Do you respond when God calls you? Every day he calls us. Every day. We just sang a song that says, you want us to fall into in this love relationship deeper and deeper. Yeah, we sing all the songs, but does it even make sense? If it is just a song, but we then just disconnect that in our daily life. Is he just content with us waking up every morning, going through the motions of the day, going to work, coming home from work, eating, and maybe a little bit of reading, and then sleeping, and the cycle repeats itself? Or is there, just as he wants us to talk to him, he also wants to talk to us. He wants to communicate. It's a two-way relationship. The Holy Spirit is wanting communion with us. God wants, desires doesn't need it. He wants it. He desires it because it is for His glory, for our good. So, do you respond when God calls you, when He, when he taps you and says, hey, go. or are you so unaware of His presence that you don't even recognize when the Spirit is calling you, when God is calling you? But Cornelius is different. He hears. He clearly sees the vision, he hears and he responds and he says, what is it, Lord? Do you do what God asks you to do? Because then he not only hears, he not only listens, he responds and then he asks, what do you want me to do? Are we too busy to do what God wants us to do? Are we too busy with our lives? He wasn't. Cornelius, this commander of the army, was ready to listen, to obey, to act. Are we? Well, last time I checked, I'm not a commander of any army. Yes, I've got a family and I've got a few things to take care of, but I'm no commander with a big responsibility. We might all have responsibilities, but nothing comes greater than our relationship and our responsibility towards God. I love my kids and I love my family. I love my wife. I love everyone, but he comes first. His will above all else. So he says, now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. He's staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. So God says, hey, I want you to send for Peter. Now, hold on a second. We just saw what a great guy this Cornelius is. You know, he's a devout man. He's a God-fearing man. He's doing kind deeds to people. He is praying. He's got it all, right? Yeah, not quite. Cornelius knew God, but God knew that he needs Jesus. You see, that's the thing. Cornelius was a God-fearing man. He was doing all the things that we as Christian, God-fearing Christians should do. But the difference between us and Cornelius is that Cornelius didn't know Jesus then. We know Jesus now. That's the difference. So God says, hey, here's what I want you to do. There's this Simon character in Joppa. I want you to go. Send men to him. Call him. He will tell you what to do. Okay. Cornelius needed Jesus. He didn't know it then. But he knew that Simon, this Peter, had something for, that God had something for Cornelius and his family through Peter. Are we like Cornelius? In that we are ready to listen to what God's calling us to do because we might be we might be the Simon or the Peter that this Cornelius out there needs. We might be that person who takes the good news to somebody. See, Cornelius at that time did not know Jesus. He had a great relationship with God, the one true God. But he didn't have Jesus. Today, we are not like Cornelius in that regard that we don't know Jesus. We do know Jesus, but we are also challenged to do all these other things, to have that relationship. Be close, be devout, be praying, be doing the good deeds that God has planned for us to do. So are we ready to be the Simon or the Peter to somebody, to the Corneliuses out there, to whoever out there? We can't if we are too busy living our life in our own terms. If we are too busy building our kingdom 
we won't have time or the desire or the awareness to a listen to God, be respond to God and then be sent out by God to build his kingdom. Because it's his kingdom that matters, not ours. There's one God. See, Cornelius knew God. In Exodus 23, the very first commandment says, You shall have no other gods, G-O-D-S, small gods, before me, says the God of Israel. Cornelius knew that God. In Deuteronomy 6.4, if you think that is important, he repeats it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Speaking through Moses, once again declaring to the people, we have one God. Cornelius knew that God. Let's once again make it clear, God says, and he, he repeatedly says this throughout the Old Testament. He wants us to know, all people to know there is one God. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Cornelius knew this God. That reference is wrong. It's meant to be John 1, 1 through 3. My apologies. It says in John 1, 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. This is Jesus that John is talking about. Cornelius knew the God of the Old Testament. Cornelius had yet to have an encounter with Jesus, the Son of God, who is God Himself, as John declares. Jesus made it clear who he is. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Cornelius didn't know this. Cornelius knew the God of the Old Testament. Cornelius had yet to have an encounter with this Jesus. This is why God, through the Spirit, in that vision, said to Cornelius, Send for Simon. Send for Justin, send for Kelly, send for Linda, send for Sean, send for Rob, send for Sri. He will tell you, are we ready to tell other people about Jesus? Do we have a relationship with Jesus enough that we a, are eager to say and are listening to the Holy Spirit so we know what to say? Or are we again relying on ourselves? Relying on what we know, oh, I don't know the Bible enough, I... I'm just not ready. Maybe one day I'll be like you. No, we've got the Holy Spirit and that's enough. So, this is the Jesus that Cornelius has yet to know. And Simon, Peter, is the one who's going to share the good news with not only Cornelius, but the rest of the family. So let's see what Cornelius now does. So he's been, he's listened to God, God called him in the vision, he listens, he responds, and is he going to act? He says this in verse 7, When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants, and after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So, Cornelius didn't go, let me get my horse. And... No, Cornelius was given an instruction, sent for Simon. Send for Peter and he will tell you what to do. So he called some of his close people, people who were trusted, people who were close to him, people who were similar to him in that regard, in that relationship with God. And he explained to them, hey, this is what has happened. This is what has happened. So go, call this guy, call this Simon Peter, bring him here because God has something for us. We are on our Christian journey together. It is not a lone ranger, I am enough, don't need anybody else kind of journey. Fellowship is very important. Sundays are extremely important, don't get me wrong. But so are times outside of Sundays. So are times outside. We need fellowship with God as much as God wants us to have fellowship with each other. This is why I said earlier, not just me, but amongst each other too. Be available, be willing. 
if you are ready, if you are willing, God will make the arrangements, not just amongst ourselves, but the people out there. The Cornelius is out there who have yet to have that encounter with Jesus because you are the Simon or the Peter that God is wanting to bring to Cornelius and his household. But we don't know that. We don't always know that. But we have to be ready and willing. How can he use us when we ourselves are estranged from him? How can he use us when we are not close to him as we should be? That personal relationship, that's where it all begins. Are you a devout, God-fearing Christian? Is the Holy Spirit the boss of you? How much time do you spend in this word? Or do we make excuses and go, I don't know, I don't understand, I don't have time, I don't this, that or the other. This applies to me as much as it applies to all of us. God wants to use us. God wants to just not only change us from the inside so we are more like Jesus. That is true. The constant renewal and regeneration of our mind so that we are more and more like Him. He wants us to love one another just as He has loved us. This is how the world will know we are His disciples if we have love for one another. But we also have to be ready and prepared, willing. Isaiah, his call is so simple. He sees a vision, he sees God on the throne and he goes, Oh, I am finished. I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The angel comes, one of the seraphs comes with a, you know, a call from the altar, touches and he says, You're healed. Your sins are forgiven you. The next question is, no context, no description, no mission statement, nothing. God goes, whom shall we send and who shall go for us? This is Isaiah 6. And, I, and Isaiah doesn't go, oh, how long is it going to be? Uh, is it in a dangerous part? Who is going to supply my needs? And, you know, what about this? And what? No, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Are we those kind of Christians? This is not a guilt trip. It's not. It's a challenge. Here is Cornelius. Listen, the angel said, your prayers have come up to God as a memorial offering. What an honor. The angel sent by God says, Hey Cornelius, your prayers have not just hit the ceiling and come back. It has reached the very presence, the very throne room of God as a memorial offering. And God is pleased. And that's why he sent me to speak to you, to tell you what you need next. To help you you and your family, to make sure you and your family hear the most important message you will ever hear. Are we that kind of Christians? When we look in the mirror, are we saying, now I have arrived? Conversely, self-condemnation is just as terrible. I'll never amount to anything is just as terrible. But <laughs> are we seeing what God sees? His child, we sang good, good father at the start. Are we seeing a child of God in the mirror? Are we seeing a child of God who has said yes to Jesus, who now has his Holy Spirit residing? Is that the person that you see when you look in the mirror? Because if it is, then everything that he has given us is still right at our fingertips. It is right here for us to build and continue to build and strengthen our relationship with God, not only for our own benefit, not only for the benefit of our family or our churches, but the community and the lost that are out there. There is a lost world out there. The street van that we were talking about, partnership, it's not just about, hey, yeah, Calvary Chapel Brisbane has street van and, you know, they partner with, no, it's not about that. It is about God's kingdom. One day when we see him face to face, I want to hear those beautiful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Are you a good servant? Are you a faithful servant? You can't be good and you can't be faithful without God, without Christ, without His Spirit. Jesus asks, this is a question for us daily. Who do you say I am? Each one of us have to answer. This is not a one-off 20 years ago question that we answer and then we forget. He asks us every single day. It's a decision we make every single day, every single morning, every single day. I have to choose to be a follower of Jesus. It's not autopilot. I have to choose to say yes to the Holy Spirit. We all do. So he can daily, we can deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him. 
So if Jesus asks, who do you say I am? There's only one of two answers. Do you believe that Jesus is God? And he determines where you go when you die. For us who have placed our trust and faith in Jesus, we know where we are going when the day is done, when our time is up. Cornelius was going to have a divine encounter with, Je with this Jesus. We have already had our encounter. But there are people who have yet to hear the good news, the good news, the gospel of Jesus. How will they hear it if nobody is willing to share it? And how will they ask for the good news to be shared if we live our lives like our lives are terrible? Oh no, the world and this and that and all oh, this tension and that tension. Instead of walking around with the joy of Jesus emanating, the light shining forth from us. That personal relationship is so key. Do you have that personal relationship? Are you the living Bible that the world sees and knows? Because they will see our life. Our life is not picture perfect. We know this. Every single one of us have struggles and trials every day. How we respond is a testimony to the world that we know there is a God in heaven. And we know that this Jesus died for us and his spirit is in us and he will see us through. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. It's that Jesus that we have. Does the world see it? So that they can ask, hey, who is this Jesus that you know? And why? Why? Why are you the way you are? Even though I know, we know your life is imperfect. So if indeed we are a disciple of this Jesus Christ, is this truth visible in your life coming back full circle? Is this faith that we profess visible in our life? How we treat each other, how we treat the world, how we are in the supermarket, how we are driving, how we are speaking, everything. It is a reflection of the faith that we claim. Jesus, His Spirit, and us, we cannot be separated. We can't just push Him aside and go, I've got this, and then you come in and give me. He is not our consultant. He is Christ, our Savior. He is always there. He should be our boss. He should be our King of kings and Lord of lords. Is He yours? If so, is that visible? Saying yes to Jesus is every moment. Never mind what other people are doing. Never mind what others are thinking or saying. What is happening in here? Is that a reflection? Or do we say, oh, because that person is this way, I can now somehow I'm justified. No. Jesus commands us, challenges us. Every person has an individual relationship. What's your relationship with me? Who do you say I am? And if you say I am your Messiah, your Savior, your Lord, do you live that confession? Never mind anybody else. And this applies to Christians too. This applies to Christians too. Because some people are this way, we should not use that as an excuse to excuse our own ungodliness. We should always strive for excellence in Christ, with Christ, through His Spirit. Are you saying yes to Jesus? Are you saying yes to Jesus every moment? So that He can use you for blessing you, for His glory. Because it's all about Him. And we are here for Him. And one day we will see Him face to face. Until then, it is all about Him. Do you know that on a daily basis? And do you say yes to Him every moment? Let's pray.